from all, to all, with all, for all, through all, we thank the gods of creation. We thank the ancestors. We thank the forces of nature. And we thank the earth. We thank them for their direction, their protection, their guidance, for keeping us, showing us, allowing us to know and enjoy life to its fullest, now and later. Black people who must love with the slow amount of time, time was ours to hold in the soft, low, warm chambers of our hearts. And was we, the half-fooled mommies and daddies of a sun world, would turn our strands of hair and two antennas to tune in the juju madness and syncopated love rhythms of Africa. And we love with time, and we took the time to love, and with the right time we love, and we love time after time. Will we ever love? love again will we ever love again will we really ever love again or will we just sit and rot away with the brighter tomorrows in the skag field rat cluttered halls of our minds black people what y'all gonna do black people what y'all gonna do will the real black people please stand up Habari, and welcome once again to our story, the program that makes being black positive, relevant, desirable, and true to a lost nation in America. A program that speaks to the historical significance of the original people of the earth. Our story network takes pride in setting itself away from other programs that centers on entertainment or rhetorical mumbo jumbo that misdirects your attention onto other things that causes you to exhaust your resources and renders you brain dead. <clears throat> it is our story who talks about commitment to you and your people. It is our story that champions the reestablishment of the black genius that once ruled the world. It is our story that focuses you in on the rewards of black advocacy, black activism, black involvement, and black power. It is our story that encourages survival of the black race and solicits your involvement to that end. Black folks must remember, race first is the call of the day, and we as a people must. I say must take the pledge if we, the people of the original race, expect to survive. As I take the many lessons I have received over the years and reflect upon them by sharing these lessons with my brothers and sisters, I realize the power that we as a people possess for the most part has gone unnoticed. The masses of black folks who have been rendered lost and disenfranchised from the meaning and mission our creators intended for us to embrace is all but depleted. It is because of the mission and meaning of the life of our ancestors that I realize 
how blessed as black people we really are. What fascinates me are the many gifts I have been granted, which allows me to distribute the information onward to you. As always, that message begins and ends with the importance of blackness. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Greetings, friends, comrades, family, the inquisitive onlookers, and our beloved viewers. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to our story network. We thank you for being with us this evening, and we trust you will take something of value away with you after the program. That is the aim and goals of our story network, the network that leads the pack in modern day communications and ancient and modern education. I say ancient and modern education because of the many errors we have found in the translations and interpretations of ancient records. The modern revelations by new black scholars have opened the window of discovery that has allowed the truth and knowledge originally disseminated by black masters of education to flourish once again. This is one of the stumbling blocks that has kept black people from rebuilding their greatness and recapturing their birthright. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our story. As part of our story's mission, we present programming that is enlightening, educational, and reminiscent of who we are and where we came from. While many of us only recognize our most recent history, Many of us realize our, where the creation story actually came from. It is because of the recent history that many of us became clouded and foggy. Tonight we are going to travel down the road of lost history as we endeavor to supply you with the basis of understanding that can very well clear the fogginess and remove the clouding that has encircled your life for a major portion of that life. I want to use as reference Faya Rose Torre's publication entitled, There's a River Flowing Through My Mind. Within the publication, Baba Dick Gregory writes the foreword for this publication. Baba Dick Gregory stated, this, our children are suffering from the lack of knowledge about their health and wealth of African history. Believe it or not, we are a sick people. Our children are sick. Racism will make anyone sick. Imagine what our neighbors would be like if young people knew the greatness of their past. They would eliminate the tearing down of our communities and from crime and, and violence. These brothers and sisters could be the new pyramid builders, end of quote. I want you to take a few minutes to go back into your life when you were half the age you are now. It is quite possible that at 50% of your current age, you were not aware of many events we now know in black history, or as I like to refer to it as our story. As many of you are aware, Juneteenth only became important to modern day blacks within the past 30 or 40 years. June 19th, 1865 was the date that black people in Galveston, Texas, were made aware of the emancipation of black people. Originally, the emancipation was declared by President Abraham Lincoln on January the 1st, 1863. But not until June 19th, 1865, were the slaves in Galveston, Texas, and other parts of the South told of the freeing of the slaves. From this came the true Independence Day for black people. But the misinformation didn't stop there. Misinformation seems to be the weapon of the enslavers and the oppressors as they equally use misrepresentation and lack of information as weapons to retard and suppress the ability of black people to gain and move forward. 
I'm sure most of you have heard how spiritually and spiritual black people are. So many of you won't be offended when I talk about the spirituality that surrounds the existence of black people. Okay, we all know that misinformation and the suppression of information is a tool of our enemy. Therefore, it will not be a shock to know our ancestors have been protecting and guiding black people through the horrors of, of captivity. A good example of this is the fact that Louisiana is a historic and spiritual area of the United States. Most of us know Louisiana played a big part in the slave trade. But few of us know that Louisiana was a central site for the original inhabitants of North America. This, according to historian Joseph Yarborough of Fort Pike Foundation in Pearl River. Now, Fort Pike is located in the area east of New, east of New Orleans, commonly known as the Wrigley's. Fort Pike is known for its defensive position during the Civil War. This area is also known as the area where one of several mounds were built in this part of America. Mounds are known to have derived from the clove people who inhabited this part of the con continent some 13,000 years ago. It goes without saying, these people were black. <clears throat> My point is, the area known as the Wrigley's was made famous by yet another composer of history. Yes, another black man. As I pointed out earlier, misinformation and lack of information is the weapon of choice of our enemies. Therefore, it makes sense that many of us are not aware of a great freedom fighter named Juan San Melo, as the Spanish called him, or Jean Saint Melo, as the French called him. Melo was a runaway slave who fought the Spanish and formed other runaway slaves called Maroons who lived in the swamps known today as the Wrigley's. The area where the clove people inhabited more than 12,000 years before the Maroons inhabited that area. The spiritual element of this history lesson is found at the point of land mass which holds the energy that replenishes itself whenever familiar people return. What also adds to the spirituality is the fact Melo uh, organized his people and fought to keep the Spanish at bay for some 11 years. Eventually, Melo was caught, tried, and hung in Jackson Square on June 19, 1784, 81 years before emancipation was announced in Galveston, Texas. If this is not spiritual, I don't know what to tell you. The combinations of the clove people, the maroons, emancipation, and the fact that we have a group of people in New Orleans bringing the facts and information to light about the forgotten hero is very spiritual. The fact that this group is making Juan Milo an essential part of Juneteenth is the adhesive that bonds black people of today with black people of yesterday. This evening, we are going to talk about the process from which you are invited to participate in, by which Juan Milo, the Maroon, the Clove people, the end of the Civil War, and the creation of Black People's Independence Day starting here in New Orleans, I present to you Brother Trent Smith, Brother Lamont Simmons, and General Rico from the um, Republic of New Africa and the United Descendants of Africa, 
who will introduce this concept and inform you of the celebrations. Brother Trent, Brother Lamont, Brother Rico, welcome to our story and share with our viewers this new and fascinating project black people can be proud of. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank uh, you. Thanks for inviting us. Um, <clears throat> this, this event, um, the whole story of Juan Malo is a, it's a, um, a story that uh, has, is not known, um, not only in, it, or it's not known nationally, um, but um, a lot of people uh, focus uh, June 19th um, to the uh, emancipation of the people of Galveston, Texas. Um, but a lot of credit, a lot of the stories that um, have been told or that has been told amongst our community, but not, you know, as a whole, uh, there was freedmen and um, maroons that had existed um, for uh, years, you know, quite a few years, you know, um, actually, um, you know, during the time of slavery, and, and everybody always wants to speak on the slave trade and um, the, the history of slavery, but very few people want to talk about the maroons. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't even know what the word maroon means. Right. You know, they get the concept of maroon. I myself, when I first heard the term maroon, I was a child and I, I was watching, uh, you know, Looney Tunes and Bugs Bunny and every time um, there was a, a person that did something, you know, crazy or buffoonish, Bugs Bunny would always say, what a maroon. And you know, and I, and I always assumed that a maroon meant moron or an idiot because that was the impression that the Europeans was giving us as as children. Um, it wasn't it wasn't until I became a, a, an adult before I realized the true uh, concepts of what a maroon is, and that concept was uh, brought to me through the uh, Maroons of the Caribbeans, the, 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 the Jamaican, the, bro the brothers and sisters uh, in the, the particular areas of Jamaica, of Jamaica that uh, had ran away from the enslavement and started their own communities and, and everything, and, uh, which actually still exists to this day. There's Maroons in Jamaica to this day. Right. Um, and, so uh, when I started, when I learned about this, um, it was intriguing to me. And then I met this brother through my wife uh, named uh, Baba Malik Rahim. And once I met him, uh, he started explaining to me that there were actually Maroons here in the United States. It completely blew my mind. And he told me the story of uh, the Maroons here in New Orleans. Um, and he gave me the history of the brother uh, Juan Malo. And I was intrigued. And so as we speak, I'm actually writing a book based on Juan Malo and the Maroons hmm. and the history of Algiers which, and, and Freetown and things like that. Um, but you know, um, when it comes to, to Maroons, there's, there's actually two particular types of Maroons. There's Grand Maroons, and then there's uh, Petite or Petty Maroons. And the Grand Maroons were the uh, brothers that jumped off of the slave ship before it actually moored Landed, in onto yeah. the land. And they, they was like, you know, I ref, I ref, I'm, not, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be in bondage mm -hmm. to no one. I will die. I will let nature take me out before I let these people take me out. Um, so they ran out into the, into the swamps, didn't know anything about, you know, uh, the, the environment. They only knew 
about where they came from. Um, but they made, but they made it happen. Yeah. yeah. And they, um, uh, the Grand Maroons were the were the, the they were called Grand Maroons because uh, they were the first set of the people that were in bondage at, at that time that broke away without spending one day, without doing one day of slavery. And they went out and formed their own communities. Um, then there were the uh, brothers that uh, were actually enslaved. And, you know, some, you know, some escaped. They escaped and where else were they gonna go? <laughs> They were going to go to those people that they heard about out in those swamps. They came from Africa as well, but are free. Um, and these were called the petite maroons. They weren't. They were slaves at one time, and um, you know were saved by the uh, the maroons and the maroon communities. And so that's that's a um, that's a brief, very brief description of. Uh, Very maroon good. To maroonage. Very good. Um, I would add, like to add that um, the word maroon comes from the Spanish word uh, si maru, which means fugitive. So we understand that the maroons was a, a rebel, someone who is not going to cow tail or bow down. Absolutely. He was going to be a man, he was going to stand on his own two feet, no matter what it got him or where he was. Right. Uh, Brother Lamont, it's good to have you. I wanted to find out more about the um, program that you guys are getting together for us and exactly where are you going to take us with this journey. Well, uh, <clears throat> like Trent was saying, this is a, this is a piece of history. That was we were all blessed with through Bob Malik. He definitely taught me the story, as well as going and do some of my own research just to find out like some documentation. But uh, what we what we really focused on doing is creating spaces where people, like-minded individuals such as ourselves and those of us that are called ourselves enlightened, who are trying to do like positive activities for our people and trying to gain ground and gain leverage and gain that unity. We creating spaces that we can come together, fellowship, commune, you know what I'm saying, have some entertainment. Our children are gonna be safe and taken care of and they're gonna have something cut out specifically for them to where you know we could really cipher and build directly, you know what I'm saying, with one another and have a good time while we're doing it. Cause we definitely gonna have a stage DJ, some live performances, uh, some singers, some rappers. It's going to be all positive, though. Definitely going to be a family environment, but it's going to be powerful at the same time. You, so I definitely recommend it? everybody to come out. And do you know where it's going to be? It's going to be at the corner of Belleville and Slidell Street. It's 800 Belleville Street, Belleville Avenue. Belleville Avenue, right? Yeah, 800 Belleville Avenue. Okay. And it's gonna it's, it's the it's gonna be based uh, the the base of it is uh, the Black Star Cafe. Mm -hmm. So if you know anyone who knows uh, where the Black Star Cafe is, that's that's exactly where the block party is gonna be. The entire area is gonna be blocked off. Okay. Well, I'm gonna get over here to uh, my general here, General Rico, and uh, thank you for coming and participating, my brother. Um, Boy, we have to get you back here so we can just talk about the uh, Republic of New Africa because we haven't had an update in quite a while. So we'll be looking for you to return with that. But tell us what your role you're playing with this and, and how did these two powerful forces come together? Well, uh, in all honesty, I am from Algiers and uh, I consider myself as a descendant of the Maroons. If I am not a descendant, the spirit surely is within me. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that, uh, you know, a lot of our history have been hidden from us. And uh, one of the things that during my travel across country, you know, 
sometimes I reach, uh, I kind of got to understand it like uh, down here that we did not uh, fight, you know, slavery, that we automatically accepted it. Uh, one of the things uh, about the Maroons was that uh, basically, you know, they was born to a strange land, but they was survivalists. I mean, uh, we see today about uh, the swamp people, you know, uh, coming all the way out of Canada and they know how to deal with alligators. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's a joke there. Uh, we taught them, the French, dealing with uh, living in the swamps. A lot of times, you know, I look back and uh, let's just look at crawfish, which a lot of people eating this month. Uh, for a time, you know, it was us that introduced the Maroons that had introduced crawfish to the table because it was part of our survival. We basically ate everything because we was denied of food. Um, you know, my thinking of uh, the brother, you know, who has set up, you know, these villages in the swamps, I mean, we must, all, we must also contribute to the women too. Because the uh, women also pay a hell of a role. Yeah, and a price. Yeah, and yeah, to yeah. this day, they still pay in that role, you know. Um, my, my feelings concerning uh, emas uh, emancipation uh, declaration that was gave by Lincoln and all of the free the slaves must we must also keep in mind that black governments was being set up at the same time and that uh the black governments was being protected by the U by the union army it was after the assassination of uh lincoln that the the vice president end up uh to make things, in other words, they end up getting the property back to the South, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, once they pull out the uh, Union troops, you know, we became the victims of terrorism. And that terrorism folks still, you know, folks a lot of us to flee. Also, a lot of us able to flee up north but a lot of us did had the opportunity to flee up north. So what we done, we fled, you know, in the swamps. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> if you just, just think about fighting against uh, disease, especially mosquitoes, you know. And then when I study history during the time of that era, I try to understand that out of all the colonies that were set up, be it Spanish, England, English, French, or whatever, but here we are 300 years later, and the blacks are still here. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, yeah. spirit, I mean, we are, it's a gift from God. Yeah. God still is protecting us. Yes, indeed. And, uh, what these young brothers are, uh, you know, bringing to the forefront, to the table, it is time that our children understand our history, not the constant repeat, repeating of black history that we constantly hear, you know, it's unwritten history, and only we can tell the story. Only we can tell the story. That's yeah, true. I give you that. And I'm looking at uh, these two brothers here that will be telling that story. And I have been invited to speak, you know, before them. And I like to say, hey, we have a very rich history. Yes. And then at the same time, look at us now. Yes, indeed. Well, bro, well, you know, I I've also have to apologize to you, uh, General Rico. I'm so used to calling you General Rico. I didn't explain that you're not only a general, but you are the president of the, of the Republic, Republic of New America. Africa. So forgive me for, for slighting you on your title, president of, uh, at the, of the Republic of New Africa. Please do. Um, 
Also, I want to just make mention of the fact that uh, Juan Milo was the type of individual who did not give any indication that he had fear or second thoughts about what he did. In fact, I'm understanding that he posted a sign at the beginning of the property that he controlled in the Wrigley's. And that sign says, um, woe to white, to the white who would pass this boundary. Letting them know that it passed here, it, it's over. And the history about him tells us that a lot of the uh, Europeans died because of him. Oh, absolutely. Now, after 11 years, they finally captured him. And did they go down to Jackson Square in front of the church down there, the good old Catholic church, tried him and hung him right down there. So, you know, this is the, uh, the history that we don't normally get. Yeah. Now, um, Trent, you had mentioned about the Maroons in Jamaica. The Maroons in Jamaica could still to this day control the area they call the cockpit. Absolutely. which is a nation recognized by the British government, Right. you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. listen, we've got, I um, want to let our listeners know that the number to participate for questions or comments is up on the screen. Uh, we have a caller waiting. We want to get to them. We thank him. Or we thank the caller for participating, watching, and enjoying our story. Caller. We ask you to turn your volume to the TV all the way down, talk to us directly in and through the telephone. What is your question or comment? Yeah, greetings. I happened to tune in when the brother of President of the Republic of New Africa was speaking, and, I, and, and then I hear you continue talking about Maroons. And I don't know if you all had mentioned uh, before I tuned in, there's an excellent book that a sister from the Schomburg Center Research wrote called Slavery's Exiles, which is the first major study of Maroons in what is today the United States. I read the book at least once every year, and it is so fascinating that when you think of superheroes that we grew up with in this country, you kind of see white folks definitely copied superheroes off of black people. These uh, 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 rescues of families living in the, there was a swampy area near North Carolina called the Great Dismal Swamp. And the sister talks about how there were people lived there so long, they had never even seen a white person. And that when the sun would come up, they would always have to come out at night. They would never come out in the day. But sometime when the sun was up and some of the young children from the maroon communities would venture off, it would damage their eyes because they had been, they would never come out in the daytime. And she goes into the living condition, and she, she documents, she talks about uh, San Malo, she talks about him, but she looks at in Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee. And she said there was one unique feature about the maroon communities in, in mainland United States, different from the Caribbean. She said building caves under the ground based on eyewitness accounts, seem to have been one of the ways in which the Maroons live in these caves underground. And in the daytime, those would go, or at night, the persons who were still on the plantation, they would provide food at night, like they would kill a hog or something and have it cut up. So all the bloods had to do was at night go on the fringes of the plantation and take the meat and go back. And in some of these swampy areas, they had rice fields and everything. It's just so fascinating, that book. And her, her name is Sylvie Ann Jouf, D-I-O-U-F. She works, she's a researcher at the Schomburg Center for African American Research and Culture. But I just wanted to contribute that about Maroons. The book is Slavery's Exiles. We appreciate and, uh, it. Thank you, my brother. So, we, it, hey, we have people who have been researching the Maroons for some time now, and that's a good thing. 
Anybody want to comment? Well, I do. I do want to make a statement. Um, I know that um, uh, according to uh, their story, not our story, uh, that uh, that uh, eleven years that uh, of the Juan Malo uh, being chased by chased by both the French and the Spaniards, uh, it was actually uh, it's actually more like uh, oh, well over twenty years. Mm. Um, they don't. There's no. There's no record of his of his birth, of course. Right. Um, and the a lot of the a lot of the information you have to understand uh, when you have when you have one black person that's humiliating an entire two entire armies from two different countries, uh, Spain and France, that not only couldn't catch him, but he was, you know, he was him, him and the and the Maroonage. They would actually, uh, they would actually go and sneak into their camps, steal their fire, steal their weapons, and and um, you know, uh, steal their weapons and uh, leave them. You know, they wake up in the morning, they don't know what they don't. You know, it's like their guns are gone. They don't mm -hmm. know what to do. So then, when they go back, when they go. Uh, out into the swamps and try to catch them. Um, of course, the Maroons had made the swamp land uh, their the part of part of their defense mechanism mm -hmm. because a lot of the a lot of the deaths uh, by the time the Maroons uh, got to them because you know nine times out of ten the Maroons was actually watching them the entire time. time right. And so they was letting nature take its course. They was letting nature take care of them. And then the ones that uh, the nature didn't take care of, didn't take care of, that's when they came in and took the rest of them out. And they left, they left just enough of them to go back and tell those people, uh, the, you know, the rest of the armies, whether it was French or Spaniards, you may want to take heed to that sign that I put up. You're right. <laughs> or this is going to happen to you, you know. Um, but they were they were embarrassed and humiliated. They didn't want to go back and uh, and tell the the, the king uh, of France or the queen of Spain that uh, that entire their, their their entire army is systematically getting wiped out by a handful of uh, black people. Yeah, Do you understand. Rude, yeah. So you know it wasn't a, it was a, it was you know from from their aspect it was eleven years, but it was actually. Uh, Way more, way more what, time than that. What, what, what I'm understanding is the significance of Juan Melo is the fact that we're talking about somebody who is right here in this area, right. that where we can immediately relate to. Indeed. And because we have not really had this, this knowledge and history, this should be an opportunity for us to really look at who our ancestors from here are and oh, what they have done. Absolutely, and that's and that's why that's why this was put together. Yeah, that's go ahead. Uh, a part of that history I want to bring into play is the the immediate mix of the Africans that they were bringing over and the Native Americans that they already had here, right? Because you know they killed all the Native American men. Once they defeated them, they start bringing the Africans over to start doing the work and developing the land. Mm -hmm. So they realized they bring out mostly African males at first, right? So these escapees, these Maroons, don't think it wasn't just a natural connection between these Africans and these Native Americans. And that's how you get that, that Mardi Gras Indian culture, you know what I'm saying? Because these same tactics that they're using to operate and do these little raids and move throughout the swamps and the group tactics that they're using is the same tactics that the Mardi Gras Indians still use. Hmm. The flag board, the spy board, like using children to go and see before the band come. You know what I'm saying? The wild man, the communication, the big chief, the second chief. You dig? All these was roles and 
actual assignments that they use to travel yeah. and to infiltrate. So we still, like, it's, that's one of the beauties of our people, that stuff that we still doing that's ancient that we don't even realize, you know what I'm saying? It's like when people say amen at the end of the prayer, and they don't know that's the Egyptian sun god, Amun yeah. Ra. You know what I'm saying? It's ancient yeah. words, what you've been saying. There ain't nothing new. Yeah. Those words is ancient. Ancient. I want to um, pop over here, if I could, to uh, President General Rico and ask him about the strategies and tactical approaches that the Maroons had and used. Um, as a military man, how would you view their performance on the battlefield? Well, you know, there's modern warfare, and then what they call unconditional warfare, guerrilla warfare, uh, based on one strength. Uh, guerrilla warfare was uh, their choice of weapon. Uh, listen to the brothers and them talking about how they had to adjust, you know, the kids had to adjust their eyes to deal with daylight. Uh, one of the things that I can also say is that we got a beautiful camouflage today with the color of our skin. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's beautiful. Uh, another thing is that when it came down to weapons, uh, we were the people that once, you know, did rule the world. It's like it wasn't nothing. They make it as if we didn't know nothing about weapons. I mean, uh, the idea was that in the swamp, you know, uh, normally when, in, you know, hunting, you normally they use shotguns in the swamp. Uh, a rifle would be really, you know, the best way to say it is that it was good with knives. Yeah. <laughs> it was good with spears. And they also know how to trap animals. In that case, they learned how to trap man. Yeah. You know, I wonder, you know, that's the sign that was placed, you know, once you cross here, you know, you it is at your own risk. Yes. And uh, they have to, you know, I kind of look at even at the, you know, I'm going to introduce, I like to introduce this, dealing with the Sons of Liberty. You know, the Sons of Liberty, which was white boys. In order for them to deal with the king, they dressed up like Indians. The Boston Tea Party, to make sure the blame go on who? The Indians and not them. But it was all a bunch of crooks anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, how they was able to be organized, you know, they took a, a stronger leader, which was George Washington. You know, George was crazy anyway. He was a colonel in the British Army, and he almost started a world war because the French had built a fort, you know, in their territory, so he went in and attacked and burned it down and everything. So they retired him. But the Sons of Liberty followed him based on his actions. You know, it's the same of today. Uh, when the Brothers and are speaking about Malo, it was based on his actions. And his actions to, I think, I'll put it this way, as one who have been incarcerated, it was a life and death struggle. The idea is to win. To win is to cheat by any means necessary. Yes, yes indeed. So that's the way I looked at, you know, they survived. Yes, well you had mentioned about guerrilla warfare and I don't know how many people know but guerrilla warfare is credited to the Maroons in Jamaica. They were the ones that first created and utilized the tactics of guerrilla warfare when they were fighting the British in Jamaica. Absolutely. And one of the, one of, one of the most important weapons that the Maroons used was blowguns. Mm. That was one of the 
premier weapons because yeah. uh, in, other, in uh, um, you know the different areas that they came from in the different parts of Africa, a lot of those tribes, that was their weapon of choice for hunting and everything. So it was very easy for them. And and the blowgun is so stealth that, you know, you think you're getting hit by a mosquito, yeah. and next thing you know, you're on the ground. That's it for you. You know, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, that was the tactic. But, you know, the, uh, the thing, the important, the, the thing about uh, Juan Malo, the, that um, actually uh, that you know holds most dear to me is his ability, his ability to use uh, his uh, guerrilla tactics to hold off uh, an entire two entire armies, and you know of course it wasn't he didn't do it single handedly but. He was, and it wasn't just Juan Malo. There was right, multitudes there was, right. of maroons in the in, within the area. He was just he was uh, he was in charge of. He had the biggest maroon community, but there was plenty of others, and they and they they worked together. This is the amazing thing. Uh, you was bringing back the issue, the the, the how uh, uh, guerrilla warfare is credited to the uh, people of Jamaica. Uh, not not only that, but there was a, a direct connection. They had communications with Maroons all across the Caribbeans yeah. and all, all across, you know, in, in different areas because, uh, uh, well, <laughs> the thing about it is they had, there, there was also, uh, the, there were Maroons that were also um, uh, what they uh, call, um, I'm sorry, it's Buccaneers. Buccaneers. Thank you, because um, they was they were also uh, uh, seafarers. Right. So um, they the, a lot of the uh, maroons that became buccaneers, of course, they would go to different ports and stuff. So they were so they were um, everything that they were doing uh, here in this country. The information was going to the maroons in Jamaica and especially Haiti. Yeah, that was a very. They had a very, very good uh, line of communication between here and Haiti, Haiti yeah. and and to this day, there's a connection, you know, because of that behind it. But uh, and so they knew what was going. It was because of the maroons here that there was that uh, there was a um, an embargo on on Haiti. Yeah. Because of the Maroons here, yeah, uh, the, the Maroons here played a large part in the uh, the uh, um, of the uh, Toussaint revolt and also Dessalines revolt. You know, uh, so there was a, there was there was a you know there was a connection, a very good connection. The lines of communication was there. You know, so uh, uh, actually was actually they had a better communication than the Europeans did. Yeah, you know. Yeah, they did. Uh, yeah, so so this it's a, it's an amazing, it's amazing, an amazing history and story um, behind the Maroons and and, uh, and that's why you know brother brother Lamont put together the first Juan Malo Day last year, mm. and this is actually the second annual Juan Malo Day. So um, all the you know we we give we give respect to. Uh, Juneteenth and what most of, excuse me, most of the country, uh, you know, they, most of the country celebrate Juneteenth because of the, the Emancipation Proclamation and, and things like that. But here in, here in Louisiana, uh, June, June 19th meant much more. Yeah. Much more than just that. Way, you know, meant much more. Um, and Juan Malo should be celebrated. The yes. Maroons should be celebrated. Yes. And that's what we're making happen. People will understand who Juan Malo is. Our people yes. need to understand the importance of the history in which we live. You know? Um, and, you know, that, that's what we're doing. It's, uh, um, of course, it's June 19th. Um, the event is, is, is going to be from uh, 10 a.m. until uh, 9 p.m. Um, 
We're going to have a multitude of vendors for the children. We have the rites, of, as, as Brother Lamont has said earlier, there's, we're calling it the rites of passage. From 10 to 5. From 10 to 5, the rites of passage uh, is for the children. We're going to have uh, uh, bounce houses and uh, space walks. We're going to have a, a video game truck. Um, and most importantly, we're going to have elders looking out for the for the children yeah. as, this, as this is going on. Uh, we're going to have free uh, uh, free snacks and drinks for the children. Um, so you know, anyone anyone um, in the area, uh, this is the summertime. There's no school. Bring your children out yeah. and come out yourself because yeah. throughout the entire day, we're going to have um, people. Come, uh, people uh, coming up and speaking up and speaking on the history of uh, of Algiers. They're going to be speaking on the Maroons and 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 speaking of speaking about Freetown and educating you know educating the children and the adults. But we need to get to the children yeah, more importantly you know, than anything. Right. I agree. You know, uh, Juan Malo should be the should be the first when you think about when you talk about. Uh, black history and black leaders. Uh, if you're from if you're from Algiers or you're from New, New Orleans, Orleans area, Juan Malo should be the first thing to come I out of your mouth. Know. I want to. Uh, we have the fastest hour in television, <laughs> gentlemen, <laughs> and I want to thank you all for coming and spending time with us and educating our viewers as to what is happening, why it's happening where it is, it's at 800, um, is that Bellevue? Yes, sir. Avenue, where the Black Star Cafe is, Bellevue. and uh, there, the, that's the 19th of this month. Yes. And actually, just a, a few day. days from now. Yeah. A week, one week from the one, day. One, one week, week from the day, next week Wednesday. Day. Day. Right, absolutely. Five to wow. Nine. Well, well, all right then. Let's, yeah. let's get out there. <laughs> could I get oh, you, could I, I get a live I... podcast from you? Oh. Could you shoot your hour story from the from the I, event? I wish I could. I oh. wish I could, but we don't have the um, the equipment to do that. Ooh. Speaking of, um, we there's a uh, there's a, some very dear brothers of mine that are coming uh, from Atlanta. And they have a, a podcast called Renegade Culture. Um, it's an uh, underground international uh, podcast. The reason that the reason that they're coming down is because of their reach. And so, as we're educating the local people, uh, this live podcast is going to have interviews with you know the, the Malik Rahim and, and other elders. They're going to be interviewing. So uh, this this uh, event. Well, it's going to be heard. Come out and from enjoy, all around. Enjoy uh, all the activities. Absolutely. Is there any contact information you have? The contact information uh, concerning concerning the yeah, if they want to get more. Yeah. The website. The well, website. Can, the website. Yeah. What's the website? Quickly, because we we're out of time. www.udaweaar.com. All right. Yes. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you, brothers, for being out here with us this evening. And uh, I'm definitely going to get over there to see you guys next Wednesday. Absolutely. So uh, before I get here, I want to thank you for being with us. I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, we're here because it's necessary that we have a platform and that we have a means of communication so that we don't have to always depend upon the other folks to broadcast for us. Have to go, appreciate you. Stay strong, stay black, but by all means, maintain blackness. Till we see you again, Yehuru Sasa Ndawa. All power to the people. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present
Yeah. Yeah. 